displacement, double displacement? Is it a synthesis? It is a decomposition. So just going through them. So you can tell me what's the first one. How do you recognize what kind of reaction that first one is? It's a single. Mm -hmm. So remember that if it's a if you see two pro reactants and two products, you know it's a displacement. Okay, so notice I have two things on the left, two things on the right of the arrow, so I know it's a displacement. If you see an element in a compound, then you know that it's only swapping one partner, so that's why they call it a single displacement. What about the second one? Decomposition. So notice that I have one reactant, two products. So think of things splitting. So this is going to be decomposition. Third one. another single displacement. So looking, I see two reactants, two products, and I see one element and one compound on each side. So that's how I know it's a single displacement. This one's also two reactants and two products, but this one is a double displacement. Do you see that both of these are compounds? So I have MgOH2 and HCl, two compounds. So that means they're swapping, swapping, swapping. They're swapping two partners. So this would be considered a double displacement. So see the difference between single and double to pick those out. What about KMnO4? No. Find the arrow. That's the key thing. Find the arrow. Count the number of reactants, number of products. If they're equal, then I know it's a displacement. But this is decomposition. So do you see that one reactant makes three products? So that if you have more products, decomposition. If I have more reactants, then I know it's synthesis. So what's the next one? That is another example of a decomposition. So see NH. CO3 splits into three things, so that means, like, think of it as breaking down. This one, Zn plus HCl makes H2 and ZnCl. Find the arrow, count how many on each side. This is a I have two reactants and two products. So I know it's a displacement and I have an element in a compound. So I know that it's a single displacement. If they were both compounds then I would know it's a double. SN plus CL makes SNCL4. Synthesis. Mm -hmm. So do you see in this one when I count, I have two reactants in one product. Okay, two things on the left, only one on the right. That's a synthesis because they're being put together. Decomposition will always have more products. Synthesis always has more reactants. Decom the displacements are going to have equal numbers on both sides of the arrow. And there, you just have to decide, is it single? If it's an element in a compound, it's a single displacement. And if it's a two compounds, then that's a double. So this next one is a double displacement. Two compounds making two different compounds. So two and two, they're just swapping partners. We're not building new things. We're just swapping the, the arrangements. And then the last one. That's another double displacement. Okay, two compounds making two other compounds, double displacement. So if you see an element in a compound making a different element in a compound, that's a single displacement. More reactants is always synthesis. More products is always decomposition. So remember that the arrow is sort of where you look. Find the arrow, count the number on the left, count the number on the right. And that's how you really can determine which type of reaction it is. So now we're gonna talk about reversible reactions today. Just so that you know, all of these, when we draw all these, notice the arrow goes from left to right, right? So it looks like it goes from this and it makes this. But there are some reactions that are what they call reversible. In fact, the one that's up here would actually be reversible. So chemically, I can take water and split it into hydrogen and oxygen, but I also can take oxygen and hydrogen, put them together and make water. So because both of those are possible, that reaction, when you draw it with the arrow going both ways, that is what a reversible reaction means. So for me, I don't have this little double arrow thing on my computer. <laughs> I 
Okay. The only way I can make that little nice looking half arrow one way, half arrow the other way is to copy it off the internet and then paste it as an image because they just don't make it in Microsoft Word. So what, what mine always ends up looking like is that. So it just looks like an, it looks like a line with arrows on both sides. That's the same thing. So either of those, remember that means that their reaction can go forward and the reaction can go in reverse. Oftentimes there's only certain reactions that can do this, not all reactions. For example, if you burn wood, you take a carbon fuel, add oxygen, you make carbon dioxide and water, but can you like take that carbon dioxide and water and like just push it back in and make it back into the wood? No. Okay, so that's not a reversible reaction, but if it is a reversible reaction, then you'll see that arrow going in both directions. Reversible reactions actually end up reaching a point where, in this example, A combines with B to make AB like a synthesis. Then AB breaks down into A and B, which is decomposition. And actually, at some point, you reach this sort of balance. So there's a forward reaction and a reverse reaction. So in the container where you have everything, you end up with all of them. So you end up with some A, you end up with some B, and then you also end up with some AB. So A and B combine, AB breaks down, and you reach this point where there's equal amounts or kind of like steady amounts of reactants and products. At that point, they call this equilibrium. So I think of equilibrium as when things are equal, when the amount of reactant and product becomes equal and doesn't change over time. So we'll actually talk about those more in another chapter, but they do introduce it in this one. All right. So we said synthesis and decomposition are really the opposite. Synthesis is when you have more reactants, fewer products. Decomposition is when you have more products, fewer reactants. Single and double displacement is when you have the chemical swapping. Same number of reactants and products. This one, this is really like a fifth. In your book, it doesn't really, it like just talks about it. It just sort of throws it down in there. And it's really almost like a fifth type of reaction because do you notice that I have an element in a compound making two elements? or sorry, making two compounds. So it's not really a single displacement. It's not really a double displacement. However, it is called combustion. And it's called combustion because this is a characteristic reaction that happens when you start with a fuel. And this can be any kind of carbon containing fuel. When you add oxygen to this fuel, you can cause a combustion reaction to occur. And you notice the same three things are always involved. So the part that can be different, the part that can be variable, is what the fuel is. So CH4, that's methane, right? Remember from chapter four. So that's methane, natural gas. We could also have C2H6, that would be ethane. That's a two carbon fuel. We could have propane, you know, like what's in your gas grill. We could have butane, what's in a big lighter. Any kind of carbon containing molecule can act as a fuel. We could even have wood, okay? You could have like the wick of a candle, anything. So this is all like the process of burning. So in this, if you take a fuel and you combine it with oxygen, you can break that fuel down and make carbon dioxide and water. And in this, remember we said these fuels, when they burn, they're very exothermic. So there's lots of heat that gets released. If it's a complete combustion, you will always see some carbon molecule plus oxygen on the reactant side, then an arrow going one direction, and then you'll make carbon dioxide and water. You completely break that fuel down. So the carbons are not combined with hydrogens anymore. The carbon is combined with oxygen. The hydrogen gets combined with oxygen and it completely burns. So think of this as being a complete combustion. Any kind of fuel can do this. So any kind of carbon material plus oxygen has the ability to form carbon dioxide and water very exothermic. However, there are instances of what they call incomplete combustion. Incomplete combustion, this happens 
when there's not enough oxygen for the fuel to completely break down. So the fuel, instead of becoming carbon dioxide, some of the carbon atoms don't combine with oxygen because there's not enough of it, and you end up with carbon. So carbon is a solid. Carbon is soot. So this is like your soot that builds up. So if you have like a fireplace and you burn wood, you end up getting this kind of blackish material that collects, even if you have a candle, okay? So a candle, I've had a candle like too close to the wall and it will even make kind of a blackish little smear on the wall. That is because the candle does incomplete combustion and there are small amounts of carbon atoms that actually end up rising and then stick to whatever it can. If you burned the nut, if you were in lab the last the two weeks ago, when we burned the nut, a lot of them had like this black stuff kind of like coming up, got all over the can. So when you went to pick up your can, everybody had black soot everywhere. That is because that nut burned so fast. It didn't burn by complete combustion and there was some carbon soot that was produced. Now this is dangerous if you burn fuel with incomplete combustion and you don't periodically clean the soot out of whatever exhaust pipe or area that it collects in. So best example, when people used to burn coal, so before we had like heating oil and natural gas, people started off, they burned wood. So everybody initially just burned wood in a chimney or just in a fireplace. And so all the carbon would go up into the chimney and it would begin to collect. If they burned coal, which is something that they did in Europe, like in the 1800s, then you would end up with a lot more carbon soot that would build up in the chimney walls. And literally it could build up so that it was a thick layer. And that thick layer is almost like putting charcoal briquettes up inside of the chimney. And so you know that charcoal, if it gets hot enough, it too will burn. So if you see that image up in that upper right hand corner, that is a chimney fire. So that is where somebody is burning wood, most likely in the fireplace, but they have not cleaned their chimney in a while. And so the fire gets so hot that it actually ignites the carbon that's in the chimney and causes the chimney to then begin to burn. The bricks of the chimney will get so hot that it'll actually ignite the timbers in the roof and so people have like burned their houses down this way. This used to be a really big issue before we went to the types of heating systems, electric and then natural gas that we have now, which is much more clean in terms of its burning compared to wood or coal. So if you do burn by wood, and I actually have some friends that have like wood burning stoves and that's their primary means of heat. They have to have somebody come in and clean the, ex the exhaust pipe that comes off of their wood burning stove every year because they'll still get carbon buildup. And so it's almost like a big brush. So I don't know if you've ever heard of people called chimney sweeps back in history. That was literally their job. They like went from roof to roof and their job was to basically take these big huge brushes and cram them down into the chimney and try to knock all of the carbon off to try and decrease that carbon buildup because in places like London, if you got a house fire, like then all these houses would burn because everybody was so close together. So that is this solid that can be made. But the bottom reaction can also happen. And in the bottom reaction, the fuel, if it doesn't have enough oxygen, the carbon can combine with one oxygen instead of two. So instead of making carbon dioxide, this is carbon monoxide. Now carbon monoxide, it is an odorless, colorless gas. So you can't tell that it's there. Most of the time when it is produced because of incomplete combustion, it doesn't make a whole lot at one time. So you make a very low amount. Unfortunately, when you inhale carbon monoxide, you absorb it just like oxygen. So when you inhale it, it goes into your lungs, it diffuses into your blood and it binds to your red blood cells and actually blocks oxygen from being able to bind to that red blood cell. 
So most of the time, this carbon monoxide poisoning is what they call it. It actually takes hours in order to have an effect on a person. So being exposed to carbon monoxide for five minutes, not such a big deal. Being exposed to low levels over hours and hours, carbon monoxide gets absorbed into the blood, binds to the red blood cell, and actually binds to the red blood cell tighter than oxygen does. So it doesn't come out. So when you inhale it, sticks into the red blood cell. You inhale more, sticks to more red blood cells. You in inhale more. And so over time, your carbon monoxide levels begin to increase and your oxygen levels begin to decrease. When your oxygen levels start to decrease, you start to feel kind of dizzy, tired, weak. A lot of times though, this happens at night. And so what happens to you at night? You get tired, <laughs> sleepy. And so it can actually be misunderstood like, oh, I'm just so tired. It could be actually misunderstood that you're just tired. So people go to bed, still carbon monoxide is entering the house because of whatever incomplete combustion they're using. They lose consciousness and then eventually they end up suffocating. Yes, but see, that's going to happen much faster because that's a smaller space and you're going to have more carbon monoxide produce than typically what happens with a bad heating unit, okay? So every year, people die by carbon monoxide poisoning. And so, you know, you, you look at this and you're like, oh, that doesn't happen. Well, it does. And it actually happens like every time there's a hurricane and there's power loss, people begin to use their generators, Okay, so people are like, it's fine, I can power the house, I got this Mac Daddy generator. You know, so they like, and it's a fuel, so it's some type of gas or diesel that they put into the generator. The problem is, is like, they put it in an area, it's not in the house because it can't be in the house because the exhaust from the generator contains carbon monoxide, but a lot of people will put it in the garage. So they put it in the garage, but they have to run the cables, like literally the extension cords from the generator into the house. So how do they run it into the house? Well, they run it through the garage door. So that, you know, you have the garage door from your house. So the cable comes in. So that means that the door doesn't shut completely. So the door is cracked. You shut the garage door because it's like during the night. So you shut the garage door, carbon monoxide begins to build up in the garage and the door is open this much to the house. So carbon monoxide just begins to flow. It just moves from diffusion, right? Gases like to spread out. So it moves from the garage and then it slowly diffuses into the house and you don't even realize that you're actually inhaling it because there's no odor, there's no color. So if you walked into a room high in carbon monoxide, you would feel like you were choking within minutes. You'd be like, ah, I can't breathe. But this doesn't happen that way. This starts off very low levels and then builds higher and higher. So these, these are actually not the most recent ones. These are two women dying of carbon monoxide leak in a home. And this is because their gas heating system had not been cleaned. And so it wasn't burning very efficiently. So you had carbon monoxide buildup and it was actually leaking into the house. Family escaped serious carbon monoxide illness after a car. So this is one where the person's car, there was a leak from the exhaust system into the car itself, okay? Low levels didn't realize it. Do you remember back in July, there were four Marines that were found at a gas station dead in the car? That's what happened. So these four Marines, they were just going out. Somebody went to go get, I don't know, get, they stopped to get gas or something at, this, at a gas station. They pulled over and parked. Maybe they're eating snacks or something but they didn't realize it that that car was actually had from the exhaust system of the car, it was leaking into the interior of the car. So they were sitting there, sitting there, they all passed out, the car kept running. They all, eventually the car ran out of gas. The next morning, somebody walks by and there's like four dead Marines in a car. So that, that was legit, like what ended up happening. It wasn't purposeful, it wasn't like, you know, because they were wondering like, well, what did they do? But then when they went and tested blood, they were like, oh, their carbon monoxide levels were high. So there was high levels of carbon monoxide that was just leaking into the car because the car needed servicing. All right, entire family dies of carbon monoxide poisoning after Hurricane Ida. So that's the one that oftentimes like you see this after a hurricane where there's a major loss of power. That's because of poorly placed um, generators. 
where they're allowing like generators. If you ever have to use a generator, you need to make sure that you can shut that door. The door needs to be closed to the garage because any kind of gas that's produced in the garage can seep into the house. So it, it is law in North Carolina, if you have a gas pack heater, you have to have a carbon monoxide detector in your house. So that is one of the criteria. If you use gas to heat your house, and even if you use your gas logs or if you have a fireplace, it's really a good idea to have a carbon monoxide detector. And so it looks just like a smoke detector. Most of them now actually plug into an outlet, so you never have to change the batteries. So that one's kind of nice. They have like little backup batteries in case the electricity goes out, but that's really a smart thing to have. I know we've, one house I lived in, we replaced a gas pack. And then the second house I've lived in, we had to replace the, the heat, the HVAC system. And in both cases, before they were allowed to turn on the system, there was a inspector that came through. And one of the things he had to see, he had to visibly see, he was like, I have to come in your house. I have to come in and I have to look at your carbon monoxide detector. You can't just tell me, yeah, I have one. I have to visibly say, I saw it. And that's because of this. Okay, so both carbon, which is a risk, fire risk, as well as carbon monoxide, those are major factors that you're going to, that could be a life-threatening issue if you use any kind of fuel source to heat your home. All right. <coughs> I don't know. I think this is the other one. Hold on. Yeah, this is the other one. That's why. I want to go to this one. Come on there. All right, so the middle part of this chapter talks about a topic that sometimes throws students, and I will just say, just sort of bear with me and just try to get the three basic components with what is known as oxidation and reduction. So oxidation and reduction, this, these are reactions that can be synthesis reactions, they can be single displacement reactions, they can be combustion reactions, but they're defined as oxidation and reduction because there is a swapping or a transfer of either electrons, oxygen, or hydrogen in a reaction. So it's gonna be one of those three. And so in this first one, this first one is always going to be where there's this swapping of electrons. Remember that happens when ionic bonds form. So you can identify these oxidation and reduction types if it is a non carbon containing molecule, but this is when we're talking about metals and nonmetals. And remember that, and the one reason you have your periodic tables that I gave them out, put them out, is remember the metal and the nonmetal. So if you see a synthesis reaction where it's a metal and a nonmetal that are combining, then you know that it's going to be an ionic bond is being formed, an ionic compound. Metals always do what? When they form an ionic compound, metals are going to gain or lose electrons. Opposite. Remember like sodium. So think of like Na, right? So remember Na? So sodium has that one electron. Chlorine has seven, right? So remember what happens when an ionic compound is formed? The electron is transferred from the sodium to the chlorine. So you would say that metals always lose electrons. That is now going to create a sodium that has a positive charge because it lost that negative electron. The chlorine on the other hand is gaining electrons. By gaining electrons now, that chlorine has a negative charge that formation of that ionic compound is an oxidation reduction reaction. So anytime you have a loss of electrons, they call that oxidation. So metals are always oxidized. So like oxidation is a noun. So you could say oxid metals undergo oxidation, or you could just say metals are oxidized. So it's sort of a verb. So either one's the same, either one doesn't matter. Oxidation and oxidized, both of them count the same. Metals get oxidized because they lose electrons. Nonmetals 
get reduced because they're the ones that are going to gain. And you can identify this. If I ask you if this, which is this an oxidation reduction reaction, it will always be a synthesis reaction and it will involve a metal and a nonmetal. So remember, synthesis is A plus B making AB. So things are forming. So if you see A plus B making a compound, that's a synthesis reaction. One of those is a metal, the other is a nonmetal. So one of the reactants is a metal, one of the reactants is a nonmetal. The metal then is always oxidized, the nonmetal is always reduced. Your book goes on and talks about the agents. I'm not really concerned about those. Okay, just remember that the metal gets oxidized, the nonmetal gets reduced. The metal is going to lose electrons, the nonmetal is going to gain electrons. So, this is an oxidation reduction reaction. So, that's one. So, that's this, uh, this electron change, and it's always going to be metals and nonmetals. Second one, okay? So, there's the first one metals get oxidized, nonmetals get reduced when you make an ionic compound. They lose electrons, these gain electrons. The second one, a combustion reaction. Combustion reactions are oxidation reduction reactions because fuels, and we'll just put CH4 because it's simple, methane, right? Just a single carbon. When I look at CH4 and then I look at the carbon on the product side, so carbon on the reactant side has four hydrogens. All four of those hydrogens are removed from the carbon. So if I look over on the product side, oxygen is added to them. So this, this part of the fuel has oxygen. If I look at the hydrogen, the hydrogen gets pulled off of the carbon and gets oxygen added to it as well. So do you see both of the carbon and the hydrogen of the fuel? Both of them end up with oxygen. That means they are oxidized. They increase in the amount of oxygen they contain. That is an oxidation reaction. So fuels in a combustion reaction, any fuel is going to be oxidized because it's going to end up both carbon and hydrogen increase in the oxygen content. So that means the oxygen has to be reduced. If you have oxygen as a reactant, I will tell you it's always reduced because it's always giving oxygen to other things. It is always going to affect and cause other reactants to be oxidized. So the fuel in a combustion reaction is always oxidized. Oxygen in a combustion reaction is considered to be reduced. The last two examples are the ones where we have this swapping of oxygen or hydrogen. They're single displacement. So remember, single displacement, I have an element in a compound, and they're swapping. So what is getting swapped in the first example? Do you see that? And I just put X and Y as general examples, okay? Because there is no X and Y. But X and Y are just general examples of anything. The first one, the compound has X is combined with oxygen. But then if I look at this, what happens to the X in the reaction. Do you see that it loses oxygen? So the X, which had oxygen, now is X all by itself. So I lose oxygen. That is reduced. The other one, Y, gains the oxygen. So I'm basically just swapping oxygen. So Y becomes Y with an oxygen, so it gains oxygen. If it increases in oxygen amount, that is oxidized. So in a single displacement, if you see oxygen gets swapped, whichever one loses oxygen is reduced, whichever one gains the oxygen 
it gets oxidized. You always identify oxidation or reduction by the reactant. So you're never going to identify a product as being oxidized. It's really what happens to XO, what happens to Y in the reaction. So notice that I always write oxidized and reduced under the reactant, never on the product side. It's always on the left side of the reaction that you write it. I have to look at what happens, but it's really what happens to that reactant. So I really define what gets oxidized and what gets reduced on the reactant side. So now looking at the last one. The last one is if you have this swapping of hydrogen, okay? So if I swap hydrogen, losing hydrogen is oxidation, just like loss of electrons. So losing hydrogen, which lost hydrogen, the X or the Y? So the X, mm -hmm. so the X had a Y, or sorry, the X had a Y. The X had an H, and then on the product side, the X is by itself. So do you see here that it lost, it loses a hydrogen? Losing a hydrogen, that is oxidation. So you could say that that is oxidized. Gaining a hydrogen, which is what happens to the Y, it gains hydrogen, and that means that it is reduced. So we can define oxidation three ways. Loss of electrons, right, like metals. Metals get oxidized when they form ionic compounds because they lose electrons. Loss of hydrogen, like that example at the bottom. Number four, X lost hydrogen, that's oxidation. Or gain of oxygen. So notice it's not the same for all three. Loss of electrons, loss of hydrogen, or gain of, elect of oxygen, those are all factors that describe oxidation. Reduction is the exact opposite. If you gain electrons, if a reactant gains electrons, like the nonmetal, that's reduction. If a reactant gains hydrogen, that is reduction. Like down at the bottom, Y becomes HY. So the Y gains a hydrogen in the reaction. That's reduction. Or if you lose oxygen. So like in this number three, X was combined with O, and then it X ends up all by itself. So that loss of oxygen, that would be considered reduction. You put a note also, oxygen as a reactant. If oxygen, if O2, and I don't mean like oxygen as a compound, I'm just saying like O2 by itself, if O2 is on the reactant side, it's always reduced. It always undergoes reduction because it gives oxygen to other things. So it's always gonna oxidize something else. So O2 as a reactant, will always be reduced. So these are really the things that you're looking at. If oxidation happens, reduction happens. So let's just practice a couple of them. So you've got that list. That's the list I want you to kind of compare and look at. So in this first one, so in this first one, first, what kind of reaction is this? I heard it, synthesis, okay? So if it's a synthesis reaction, then V and O, where is V, where is O? In terms of the periodic table, this is A, V is 23, so it is A, it's a metal. Do you see V, number 23, right next to chromium? O is a non-metal, okay? So this is a metal and a non-metal, so this is making an ionic compound. You don't even need to know what V is. It's vanadium, but you don't need to know that. But you can find it on the periodic table. So if you see it's a synthesis, look to see if it's a metal and a non-metal, because we know that metals get what? Oxidized. 
okay? Non-metals get reduced, and it's oxygen, which is another way you know it's reduced, because oxygen is always reduced. Okay, look at the next one. So what is this next one? This is a what? C2H6 plus O2 makes H2O and C CO2. What kind of reaction is this? Hmm? I have two and two. It's not a double displacement because see the O2? Double displacement would be two compounds making two compounds. It's not a single because this is a compound in an element making two compounds. So looking at it, what is this? Combustion. And yes, I wrote, I didn't write CO2 in water. I put water plus CO2, but those are going to be the products, right? Water and CO2 are the products. So we said the fuel, what happens to the fuel? If it's a combustion reaction, the fuel is always oxidized. And oxygen is always reduced. So remember I said, if oxygen is a reactant, it's always reduced. Okay, what about this one? So when you look at this, this is a synthesis, decomposition, single displacement, double displacement, or combustion. Double displacement would be two compounds making two compounds. This, this is a single, mm -hmm, because this is a compound plus an element making an element and a compound, right? So remember, if I have a compound and an element making a compound and an element, then I know that this is a single displacement. So now the question is, am I swapping oxygen or am I swapping hydrogen? Because if it's a single displacement, that's what I'm looking for. So when I look at Fe3O4 and H2, my suggestion, look at the element and see what happens to it. So look at H2 first. What happens to H2 on the product side? It gains oxygen. Do you see that? Okay, H2 becomes H2O. So this gains oxygen. So if it gains oxygen, that means it is oxidized. So then what happens to Fe3O4? Do you see that it then ends up with Fe? So it loses its oxygen and ends up being the single element. So it loses its oxygen. So that means it is reduced. So if you see it's a single displacement, look at the reactant element, see what happens on the other side. Does it gain or lose oxygen? Does it gain or lose hydrogen? So look at the last one. The last one is a what? What kind of reaction is it? It's another single displacement, so it's an SD. Number single, num, another single displacement, compound plus an element makes a compound plus an element. So I know I've got just swapping a single pair. So look at the BR2. What happens to BR2? Mm -hmm. So then it combines with the hydrogen. So we say it gains a hydrogen. If you gain a hydrogen, what is that? I heard it. Look at your chart. If you gain a hydrogen, it is reduction. Mm -hmm. So you would say, I just say it's reduced. It's shorter to write than reduction. A couple less letters. Okay, then look at NH3. So now do you see that NH3 goes to just N2? So it does what? Uh -huh. It loses its hydrogen. That means it is oxidized. Okay, so we'll do another one of these next time. I don't think I have another one specifically on. Yes, I do. Right there. So I'm not going to do these ones. There's one, two, three, four, five. But we'll do these ones next time. So just practice. Identify first what kind of reaction. If it's synthesis, then it's going to be an ionic compound. Find the metal, it's oxidized. Find the non-metal, it's reduced. If it's a combustion reaction, the fuel is oxidized, the oxygen is reduced. If it's a single displacement, you got to find the element on the left and figure out, does it gain or lose oxygen, right? So it'll either gain oxygen or it's going to gain hydrogen. So figure out which one it is, then you can identify it as being oxidized or reduced. 
So here's an interesting sort of connection with oxidation and reduction. And this happens in the body by special cells that are in your liver. They're called hepatocytes. They are specially designed to be able to detoxify chemicals that you might ingest. So this includes alcohol. This also includes like Tylenol, Motrin. A lot of your antibiotics get broken down by these hepatocytes. Their job is to take things that are not nutrient-based and break them down so that you can get rid of them. So ethanol. Ethanol is CH3CH2OH. It's got that alcohol on the end. Now, ethanol itself is actually toxic to cells. So this is why like people, if like your blood alcohol goes too high, it can actually shut down your nervous system. You can stop breathing and like that's how people die of alcohol ingestion. Normal ethanol ingestion. If you drink one glass of wine, one beer, not all of these, one or, you know, one glass of wine or one beer or one shot of liquor <laughs> in the course of an hour and you have a healthy liver, then the cells in your liver when they come in contact with that concentration of alcohol, they can take the ethanol and they can convert it to acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde is not toxic. Acetaldehyde can actually be used for energy by your body cells. So what happens, or, and it is an enzyme. Remember we talked about enzymes. So enzymes like take these things, help to speed up the reaction. They can handle, the hepatocytes can handle this. So looking at ethanol, how many carbons total in this formula? CH3, CH2OH. How many carbons? Two. How many hydrogens? Six. And then oxygens? One. So that's like a molecular formula. The top one is really that condensed structural. Then how many, how many in acetaldehyde? How many carbons? Still has two. How many hydrogens? Only four still has the oxygen. So what happened to the number of hydrogens? They went down. So in this, ethanol loses hydrogens. So what did we say that is? Loss of hydrogen is oxidation. So ethanol gets oxidized in your liver. Let me do a different color. So ethanol gets oxidized by this enzyme and converted to acetaldehyde. And it does this because acetaldehyde is less toxic, easier to get rid of. But these enzymes, remember we kind of drew them like the enzymes, how they bring in the reactant, speed up the reaction, then let go. So the enzyme alcohol dehydrogenase is the enzyme that does this, and it's in these liver cells. Enzymes can only do things but so fast because the enzyme has to take the ethanol, break it, and then let it go. Grab another ethanol, break it, and then let it go. Grab an ethanol, take off two hydrogens, let it go. They just keep doing this. But it takes like, it's sort of like there's a maximum speed they can work at. So their maximum speed means they can handle about a glass of wine an hour. So what happens if you're like the bottle of wine an hour person? Okay, so if you are ingesting more than the enzymes can handle, the enzymes can't do it but this fast. This is like as fast as they can handle it, okay? So if there's a lot more alcohol there, the alcohol begins to have a toxic effect on the body. And those cells are the sensitive cells. So if there is too much alcohol, then those cells in the liver can die. And if they die, then no more enzymes doing this. So if you start off with you know, a million liver cells and some of them start dying because of excessive alcohol exposure, they don't grow back. Your liver is pretty amazing. If, you're, if your liver is healthy and you're in an accident and you damage your liver, they can remove the damaged part and it will grow back. So a healthy liver regenerates. So you can actually give a piece of your liver like you know, to your kid or somebody that needs one and they'll, it'll actually grow and like take over the function of the liver if it's healthy. But if you damage the liver by ingesting toxins, then those liver cells die convert to scar tissue and they don't grow back. So the liver actually starts looking hard, bumpy. Normally the liver, I don't know if you've ever seen calf liver or beef liver. It's like super red and it's like real spongy feeling before you cook it. 
So normal liver, very vascular, but when you see liver that has had this chronic alcohol abuse, it is shrunken, it gets kind of bumpy, it looks more like a pickle, and that's why they say like you've pickled your liver, that's like that saying. That is because literally the liver starts looking like that, it gets more gray in color. Chronic alcohol abuse is what leads to this. This doesn't happen in one night. So, you know, you like go on a bender one night, you're not gonna have cirrhosis the next day. This is something that, like I said, every time you do this though, you start having damage. So you're causing this damage over years. So over years, you end up with so much liver damage that the, that the liver can't function anymore. And that is what is determined or called cirrhosis. So that's the C-I-R-R-H-O-S-I-S. -I -S. Cirrhosis of the liver is this chronic damage and scar tissue that builds up. So the bottom one is methanol. So methanol is CH3OH. Ethanol is called grain alcohol. So ethanol is what you find in wine, beer, spirits. But methanol is called wood alcohol. So it is made by fermenting wood. It's used in commonly as a solvent and there is no restrictions on its sale. So it's not like checked over by the, the ABC board, you know, so the alcohol division doesn't do anything. You can go buy this at Lowe's. Okay. So you can go buy methanol all day long. So it used, it's like a common solvent that's used. Unfortunately, if you ingest methanol, most of the time I told you enzymes are very specific. They only work on certain things. Alcohol dehydrogenase works on methanol too. So, especially during prohibition, during prohibition, the sale of alcohol was outlawed. And so people were kind of hard pressed. So they were like, oh, we have ethanol. Oh, look, this is methanol. Maybe this will help. Maybe I can drink this too. Okay. The problem is, is when you ingest methanol, it gets absorbed. When it gets to your liver, your liver does oxidation on methanol as well, but it converts it to formaldehyde. What's formaldehyde? It's toxic. Why? It's, it's something that you find in what? It's in formalin, formaldehyde. It's, it's what they like soak dead stuff in. This is like when you dissect your pigs in anatomy. This is what your pigs are in. This is embalming fluid. <laughs> this was all during prohibition. So in North Carolina was like notorious for a lot of moonshining. So people would take like their corn, corn mash, ferment it. They would be making like their bathtub gin is what they used to call it. Because like people would literally like ferment this in the bathtub. Okay. Craziness. But if you don't have the right grain, if you have too much wood in like mixed in. So say they didn't shell the grain so they had some wood, some fibrous material in what they were making. If they didn't distill it correctly, because when you distill, you actually get like different kinds of alcohols, small alcohols, big alcohols out. And if you don't distill it correctly, you end up collecting all the alcohols. And so then drinking that, you're also drinking methanol as well as ethanol. Some people would actually add methanol because it would increase the volume of their batch. Okay, so they had people embalming fluid will cause your liver to pickle very fast because it is the liver cells that end up getting exposed to this when they oxidize methanol. It also causes damage to the optic nerve. So one of the first things that they would see is people would go blind. Okay, so that was one of the very first things that like one of the first symptoms, they were like, uh-oh, <laughs> what have you been drinking? So I will just tell you, it's some of these all-inclusive resorts in Mexico have you heard in the last five to eight years that there's been these like mysterious deaths? Like people just found dead in their hotel rooms. Some of it's been traced back to in an inclusive, all inclusive resort, all the food and alcohol is included. And one of the common things they would do is actually leave open bottles of liquor on like the dresser, like on the little stand where the, where the bar is in your room, open bottles. Okay. So like, one time we've stayed there, I was sort of like, what is that? Like, <laughs> and they're like, oh, if you want to drink in your room, why would I want to drink in my room? <laughs> I was like, like, isn't there like a perfectly good bar, like, like a hundred feet away from where we're staying? And so it's like, no. So if you wanted to like have something in your room, I was like, okay, then I was like, but these are all open. It's not like little airline bottles where they're all sealed. 
So some people working there were actually taking the alcohol and replacing it with methanol. So they had some people, some tourists that stayed there, drank the alcohol in the room, and then didn't feel well, a couple days later did. So that was like, they've like tracked that back. So now these inclusive rest, these all inclusive resorts, they do not have open bottles. Never drink from an open bottle, okay? That's just not a good plan, okay? If you're ever in a bar, don't ever put your drink down, take it with you to the bathroom, okay? Never, unless you know somebody very well and they're not gonna like roofie you. That's the other thing that would be a challenge. Never drink from an open bottle, okay? Just not a good plan. But that, now, they actually have like little airline bottles. So they don't put like the big fit, they would have like a fifth. They were like, a fifth of whiskey, a fifth of rum, a fifth of vodka. I was like, that's a lot of alcohol. For, like, <laughs> we're only here for a few days. Like, my liver hurts just looking at that. Yeah. So that is, so they have made changes, but that's what they were founding. It's like some of the people were like taking the alcohol and just replacing it, thinking, oh, no, it'll notice this. But they were putting the wrong stuff in. I mean, I wish they'd put water in, but then maybe that would have been figured out, but that was, that, was a, that was actually some of the deaths that have happened in some of those resorts in Cancun have all been traced back to contaminants added to open bottle bars. There, just my, my, my two cents for you for the day, okay? Work on these. See if you can go through these questions. Identify what gets oxidized, what gets reduced. These are good examples of them. So this last part, this is kind of the last part of the chapter, goes into some common reactions that you're going to see for the rest of the semester. So we're not going to, we did talk about single synthesis, decomposition, single and double displacement, combustion reactions, oxidation reduction, identification. But condensation and hydrolysis are really how your cells put things together and pull things apart. So when you build muscle, that is always condensation. When you digest food, that is always hydrolysis. So what it really uses is it's either forming water molecules or using water molecules to be able to break things. Condensation, when I think of condensation, I always think that, oh, water's made, right? Condensation on your windows, your windows fog up. Condensation in the bathroom when you take a shower, you get the fog on the window, that's water. So think condensation, water is a product. With condensation, the way you make water, one molecule loses an OH, the other molecule loses a hydrogen. So H and OH combine, and that's where you get your water. Those two being pulled off, these two molecules that are left, if they lose a mole a, an atom group, they have to combine to maintain their stability, their total octet. So that is going to cause this oxygen then to be able to bind to the adjacent molecule, and that is a building reaction. So we're actually building, taking two smaller molecules, putting them together. This is how you take sugars and make disaccharides. This is how you take sugars and make polysaccharides. This is how you take amino acids and build proteins. So anytime you're doing these building reactions, that is always gonna be a condensation reaction. So just remember condensation, small molecules get put together and water is a product. But then if we look at the reverse, because these are reversible, so when you get big molecules, so you eat like a big piece of steak, so you have a lot of big proteins, you gotta break those proteins down into their small little building blocks before you can absorb them in digestion. So in your stomach, you have enzymes and hydrochloric acid that work on hydrolysis. So they're gonna actually do the reverse of that reaction. In hydrolysis, you're going to add water to a bond. So you don't truly like add water. You take water, you put a hydrogen, hydrogen gets added and an OH gets added. And in doing that, I'm gonna break a bond. So I'm gonna break the connection between these two molecules and I can stabilize that break by adding an alcohol to one side and adding a hydrogen to the other side. And in this, I'm taking one big molecule and I'm making little molecules. You will always see hydrolysis Water is a reactant. Digestion 
Good example of hydrolysis. Breaking down big, huge proteins, carbohydrates, starchy molecules, even lipids, all have to use hydrolysis because we've taken these big molecules and we've got to break them into little ones. Condensation, these are all the protein synthesis, the building reactions. If you want to make like store big molecules, that's always going to be condensation. So things like build proteins. Build polysaccharides. So remember in class, yeah, in lab yesterday, we looked at the ripening in bananas. And so one of the things a banana does is it makes sugars because it uses sunlight, but then it takes those sugars and links them together to make a big starch molecule. So that's thousands of sugar molecules linked together. Every single link is formed by a condensation reaction. So you pull a hydrogen off of one, alcohol off the other, that links these two together. You do it to the next one and the next one. So you can build very large molecules doing condensation. But hydrolysis is what happens when that banana ripens. So now you got this huge starch molecule and you need to start chopping it into smaller pieces. And that's why the, it gets softer, loses its starch, and it gets sweeter because you have more and more sugar produced, the little single sugar units. They give their example showing how your cells actually use hydrolysis and condensation to collect energy as nutrient molecules are broken down. So inside of your cell, you have fats, sugars, amino acids. They can all be used for energy. We really like to use glucose. We really like to use sugar for energy. It's very clean. It's clean burning because it's really a combustion reaction. Glucose combines with oxygen and makes carbon dioxide and water. And we don't do incomplete combustion in the body because we have enzymes. So enzymes are gonna make sure we get all the carbon dioxide and water made. But in this, when you break down nutrients, when you break bonds, energy is released. So this energy, from breaking nutrients into smaller and smaller pieces, that energy that comes in is enough to take a phosphate molecule. So here, remember this is that phosphate, PO4 minus three. This is the phosphate ion. This is actually hydrogen phosphate because it's got one on there. We'll just call it the phosphate ion. There is enough energy that's released can take that phosphate and add it to the end of an ADP. That's this molecule over on the right. It's called adenosine diphosphate. Diphosphate, because can you see that there's two phosphates there? So that's how it has that ADP. And when it does that, now it's going to have this. That link is actually a very high energy bond that is formed in order to make ATP. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. This is what they call the universal energy molecule of the cell. I'm sure in biology you've heard it termed that. It's sort of like this, this like random term. <laughs> really what that's meaning is that your cells make this because now you have like, it's, it's kind of like money. You have like this currency. You have this energy currency that then you can use to power whatever the cell has to do. Some reactions might release a little energy. Some reactions might release a lot of energy. ATP always releases the same amount of energy. So when we form it, that's condensation. So going in this direction, going in the forward direction, that's condensation. And then when you need to make proteins or your cell needs to grow or your cell has to respond to changes in the environment, then that can release ATP's energy by hydrolysis. So notice that that's like a reversible reaction going in both directions. I was telling classes like, this is metabolism basically. So we are going to break things down to be able to make energy, build, make ATP, so we can use that ATP to be able to build things that we need. And I was like, it's kind of like why you work. Right? So you work so you can get paid, so you can spend your money doing things you want to do. 
right? So you work, you get paid, you spend your money doing things you want to do, hopefully. At some point in your life, hopefully you get to that stage <laughs> where you can do things you want to do, not things you have to do. <laughs> but that's the same thing here. So the cell breaks down nutrients to make ATP so that it can do the things it has to do. So it can build protein, so it can grow, so it can repair, so it can act like a muscle cell and contract or act like a nerve cell and conduct nerve impulses. Whatever that cell has to do, ATP is kind of the currency to be able to do it. So we're going to throw in this bit in chapter four that I did skip. It's all about lipids. And the reason that we put it in here is because it's the last type of chemical reactions that you're going to see. So lipids first, we're going to give a little background. Lipids, when you look at a nutrition label, this is always listed as fat. And that's just because that's kind of an understood or a common term. But fat is really just one type of lipid. There's fats and then there's oils. Fats are usually solid at room temperature. Oils are usually liquid at room temperature. And they together really fit the characterization of lipid. So lipid is really like the big class. That's really what it should say on your, on your nutrition labels. It should say lipid. But then people will be like, what's that? <laughs> but if you put fat, they're like, oh, I know what that is. So lipids are really our first nutrient molecule type. Next chapter, we're going to do carbohydrates. Then we're going to do proteins. Then we're going to do nucleic acids. So really from this part forward, we're really going to do more nutrition kind of chemistry. So we'll do nutrition in terms of like foods as well as health and add all a lot of the more common diseases and issues that you might come into play with in your jobs as we go through the rest of the semester. So lipids, by definition, lipids are a class of molecules in living cells that are, contain what are known as fatty acids. So fatty acids are long chains of carbon, which makes them like a fuel, but the acid on the end is called that because they have a carboxylic acid group. So do you remember that carboxylic acid group in those functional groups? It is one where it's got those two oxygens. So it's got a long chain of carbons, somewhere between 12 and 22, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11, 12. This one is just 12. On the end of the chain is a carboxylic acid group. All those carbons have what? Hydrogens, because remember carbon has to have four covalent bonds. So even though I don't have them drawn in, remember that above, below, above, below, and all the way on the left, those all are hydrogens. So that last carbon is a CH3. All those middle carbons are CH2s. All the way over on the end is a carboxylic acid functional group. So this one, all of the bonds between carbons are single. They call that a saturated fatty acid. All the carbon to carbon bonds are single. And it's much easier to draw this with the little zigzag, right? With the zigzag, because those single bonds, remember that the carbon, the shape of the carbon is that tetrahedral. So it actually starts to create the little zigzag. So the skeletal structure for that one up top, one, two, one. Would look like that. <laughs> See how much faster that was? So count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve carbons. The end carbon has a double bond oxygen and an OH attached to it. So in a skeletal structure, you don't put any of those carbons or hydrogens, but that zigzag pattern is nice and straight, right? We could like bend our molecule out to make it nice and straight. So these saturated fatty acids, and this this keep forgetting to change this slide. This is a saturated fatty acids, not unsaturated. So here's some examples. So lauric acid is a fatty acid that has 12 carbons, just like the one that we drew. It's found in coconuts. Myristic acid is one that, with 14 carbons. So you see it just looks like it's got one more zigzag. Then going down, palmitic acid found in palm oil. That's got 16. 
stearic acids found in animal fat. So like if you get like a roast or if you get like a burger and you get the grease that like congeals on your, on your plate. So there's going to be a lot of stearic acid in that, 18 carbons long. We can go as long as behenic acid found in canola oil, and that's 22 carbons long. So these don't mix with water. Almost all carbons, that one, those two oxygens at the end, they really can't overcome the fact that you got all those carbons. So that's why those lipids are nonpolar. That's why lipids don't mix with water, your fats and oils that they separate out is because they're almost all carbons and hydrogen. So they act a lot more like fuels, like the hydrocarbons that we talked about in chapter four. But now, if you have a double bond, there are fatty acids that have double bonds. If they have one double bond, then that is called a monounsaturated. So these are un, not saturated. Mono means? One, so anytime you see mono, mono means one. This just means that there's one double bond in the molecule. And that's the double bond in the carbon chain because you know there's a double bond in the carboxylic acid group on the end, but this is referring to the double bond in the chain. So palmitoleic acid, oleic acid, these are 16 and 18 carbons long, each only have one double bond. Then you can have polyunsaturated. So next time you look at a nutritional label, now they start to split these out. So they will list saturated fatty acids, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated. Polyunsaturated means that it has two or more. You just think more than one. More than one is considered poly. So linoleic acid has two, alpha linoleic acid has three, and then there's the arachidonic acid has four, don't have to remember any of their names, but you should remember monounsaturated means there's one double bond in the chain. Polyunsaturated means there's more than one double bond in the chain. And in fact, those two in the polyunsaturated, so linoleic and alpha linoleic acid, commonly called omega-6 and omega-3. So a lot of people that try to take nutritional supplements, they try to increase their omega-6 and omega-3s, one, because these are essential fatty acids. When they refer to anything in your diet as essential, that means that you need to ingest it. That means that you can't make it, it needs to be obtained in your diet. So people oftentimes take supplements of omega-6 and omega-3s, but you can get this in your diet if you have any kind of fat intake because they're commonly found in soybean, corn, canola, flaxseed. Like most of the foods that you eat, if there's any fats in them at all, it's going to be those. So they're really not difficult. It's not like you need to be taking large amounts of them supplemental-wise because most people get these in their diet as a routine basis. So what are they for? Why do you need fatty acids? Fatty acids, the function of lipids in your diet. Big thing, you need lipids to be able to build membranes. Membranes are the covers on your cells, like your cell membrane. Also inside of the cell, you have organelles. Organelles have membranes as well, like mitochondria. They got like a double wall. Right? So they're going to need twice as many membranes. Then you got the nucleus. So the nucleus, which encloses your DNA, that's got a membrane that encloses it. Lysosomes, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, any organelles inside of your cell, they're enclosed. Whatever's inside is enclosed by a membrane. So fats and oils in your diet can be used to build those membranes. So they're important. Second one, insulators. So this is like one of the big ones. Insulators. Myelin. So what myelin is, myelin insulates a nerve. So myelin is sort of a wrapping on a nerve that lets nerve impulses go about 100 times faster than they would. You build this myelin to a large degree before you're two years old, right? So when, remember by the time you're two years old, your head is like 80% of its adult size. So that's why those little toddlers have those big heads walking around, okay? That is because that brain is, grows fastest compared to all of the other organs, myelin insulates those nerves so that nerve impulses can be sent quickly. 
so that you can start responding to things fast enough to be able to maintain your balance, to be able to like have normal reflexes continued. This is why they tell you that you should not give children low fat milk until they're past the age of two because they need the fat in it to be able to make plenty of myelin for those little developing nerve fibers. Fats also can help to protect internal organs. You have fat underneath the skin in the subcutaneous layer that helps in insulation, but it also acts as kind of a cushion, right? So it helps to keep, like if you bounce up against something, you've got that little bit of fatty layer that helps. It's gonna help as a body temperature regulator. You know that people, as they get older, their subcutaneous fat levels decrease. And so they always feel what? Cold. So when you go to your grandmother's house and you go in and you're like, it's 80 degrees in here. She's like, and she's got a sweater on. I'm like, Granny, what in the world? But that's because she's lost a lot of that subcutaneous fat. So she has lost some of that insulation. And so then she's much more cold natured. The, unfortunately, it makes it more difficult for them to maintain normal body temperature regulation. Last one, you can use fats that you eat for energy. Okay, so you can break down fats. You have fats, you have amino acids or proteins, and then you have carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are really what your body likes to run on, okay? Because it releases a lot of energy and it's really easy for cells to produce energy from it. But fat is kind of its backup. So if you're doing exercise and your body's using carbohydrates to make your muscles contract, if you're doing this exercise for a while, your body starts to burn fats too to help supplement it because it doesn't wanna run out of carbohydrates. So then when they say you're doing fat burning exercises, that just means that you're doing exercises long enough with enough force so that you wanna actually add fat as part of that energy source to maintain that exercise longer so that you don't run out of glucose too fast. So we'll talk more about like that whole process later in the chapter. I will quit there. Because we want to talk about, like, we can finish this chapter on Tuesday. We want to talk about, like, how fats and oils are different. We'll talk about trans fats and then those last ones, the addition reactions.